Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hula Hoop. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we're continuing our, our message, our, our message series entitled Faith Revisited. And this message today is called Where is Your Faith? Faith seems so small and insignificant, yet our whole religion hinges on it. For without it, it's impossible to please God. Matter of fact, without faith, it is impossible to gain salvation because it's by faith that we are saved. So we had better know where our faith is. And today's message, as we said, is entitled, Where is Your Faith? Last week's message, part one, is entitled, The Catalyst. In it, we defined the word faith and found that faith is used two different ways. I call it the simple faith and a complex faith. We also learned that there are three different types of faith. Expectant faith, blind faith, and hope faith. And now, today's message. Where is your faith? Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 8, verse 22 through 25. And this is about Jesus and his disciples when they were crossing the Sea of Galilee and they ran into a storm. Jesus had told his disciples to get into the boat and cross over. Let us pick it up there now, Luke chapter 8, verse 22, all the way through to 25. One day, he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake. And they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. And they ceased and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? So, like I said, one day Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and he told them, go across to the other side. We're going from this side of the shore or this side of the lake to the other side of the lake. You and I, let us go. I want you to please understand that this was an indirect promise from God. As it were, they had all followed Jesus under the belief of him being Israel's Messiah, meaning they believed he was the son of God. And that is why they followed him. And the signs and the wonders and the miracles that he performed only serve to confirm or solidify their beliefs that he was the son of the living God. So as they sailed on or rode on, whatever the case may be, the, the weather on the lake changed for the worse as it seemed to do quite frequently. The Sea of Galilee, it seems like the, the wind would come down and, uh, and the weather change would come down on the lake and storms would frequently rise up on this Sea of Galilee. And so it happened that time that the seas grew rough and the wind began to blow and the boat or, or the waves began to break over the bow of the bro boat and the boat was beginning to fill up with seawater. But Jesus was nowhere to be found. When they looked around, Jesus was not there. He was asleep in the storm, stern of the boat during the storm. So when it looked like they might capsize and that they might all drown, they made a corporate decision to wake Jesus up and have him help them. So they did just that. They woke Jesus up. 
They woke him up saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And Jesus got up and rebuked the wind. He rebuked the waves and everything went calm. It was as if the storm had never happened at all. Then he turned his attention to his disciples and he gave them what I call a gentle rebuke. Now, why would Jesus do that? Why would he rebuke his disciples who came to him for help? Maybe it was because they had disturbed his sleep. Or maybe he hadn't finished his sleep out. And when they woke him up, he woke up on the wrong side of the bed. So he was a little bit grumpy. Maybe, maybe, just maybe. But I don't think that was the case. I believe it went a little bit deeper than that. I want us to read that last part of our scripture again. Luke chapter 8. The last part of verse 24 and verse 25. It says, And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, that is his disciples, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water? and they obey him. Well, the first thing that Jesus did was to, obviously, wake up. He woke up. And when he looked around, he saw the wind, the waves, and he felt the boat crashing up and down, and he felt the water all about on his, around his ankles. And he knew what his disciples had woke him up for, because they said, Master, we're perishing. So he got up and he rebuked the wind. He rebuked the raging seas. And the wind and the raging seas obeyed him and they ceased. And then there was a calm. When you looked out over the waters, it was like oil. It was smooth, not even a ripple in the sea. I wonder if there were other boats in that storm. Other boats that maybe were out fishing and had got caught in that storm. And they too were thinking that they would perish. And then all of a sudden, it just calm. That's not normal. I wonder what they were thinking. I wonder what was going through their minds. But that is what happened. When you're in a storm and Jesus brings you deliverance, those around you will be delivered as well. It's just like Paul and Silas when they were in the prisons and their chains were set free. Those in the cells were set free as well. But after the calm, Jesus got up and he rebuked his disciples with a question. Verse 25, he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled. Now, here is what we must try and figure out. Why did Jesus, why would he rebuke his disciples? What had they done wrong? I thought that they did what any sensible person would do. They went straight to the source of power. Well, didn't they? Then they go to the power. Jesus was the power. They had seen all that he had done. They believed in who he was, so they went to him. One could assume wrongly, it would seem, but nonetheless, one could assume that they did exactly what they were supposed to do, but obviously not, because Jesus rebuked them gently, gently, but a rebuke Nonetheless, the rebuke came in the form of a question, where is your faith? See, that's, that's a little puzzling to me. I thought they had faith because they went to the source. See, this is what Jesus did though. When he spoke to them about faith, he used the complex form of the word faith. He asked them, where is your, the faith? 
This goes a little bit deeper than the regular simple form of the word faith, pistis. Let us just remind ourselves of the definition of the word, the faith. Oho pistis, which we covered in our last, or our first um, message in this series. So from last week's message, this is the definition of the complex word, the faith. Oho pistis. It means... Faith or believing as in a personal relationship to Christ. The acceptance of the message as in charisma. It believes that Jesus is God and he purchased our salvation with his death and resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of power. And now we can do all things through Christ. That same Christ who died and was raised to life again, we can do all things through him because he is the one who gives us strength. He's the one who gives us his Holy Spirit and baptizes us in the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit. This faith is what we need to perform miracles because without it, we only have a belief. We can receive but we cannot perform miracles. The word Jesus uses here is the word oho pistis. Where is your faith? Or in other words, where is your the faith? Oho pistis. Now, it makes sense to us then because Jesus was not rebuking them because they had woken him up, but because they were asking him to do something that they themselves should have done. He said, where is your, the faith? Why are you waking me up to do what I have prepared you to do for yourselves? Jesus had already given his disciples authority on the, the faith. And now the time for them to use it or to put it into action had come. But instead, they expected Jesus to do it for them. It's like us today. We pray, oh Lord, heal this person. Heal this, this, this woman. Heal your servant. Do this, do that. When Jesus has anointed us to do it for ourselves, he said, those who believe will do these things. So, they expected Jesus to do for them what he had prepared them to do for themselves. Why? Because they did not have the faith or the understanding that they, they could do these things and that they took it, that, that Jesus was the only one who could do those things when he was preparing them to carry on the ministry of healing, of preaching the good news and getting souls saved. It's all in one. It comes in one package. For he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. You see, in today's society, we have so watered down the gospel, the gospel message that Christians do not believe that we have what it takes to calm the storm in our lives and in other people's lives. All we need to glorify God has been given to us. I want to show you the difference between the first church's attitude and our attitude today, today's church attitude. See, if we preach that we have the Spirit living inside us and that we can do what Jesus did because He said we can do it and He has given us authority to use His name so that we can do it, then we are called blasphemers, hypocrites, 
false witnesses, false teachers, false prophets, among other choice words. They cite passages like 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 5, Acts chapter 8, verse 9 through 13 without fully understanding that they're condemning their own words. Let us read those two chapters and see what the writers were actually telling us. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. This is Paul's writing. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and depraved of the truth. You see, to these people, Paul is saying that we are to be meek and assuming. That's, that's, that's how, how today's church views that, that, um, that portion of scripture. That we should uh, herald the, the saying of, of, which is accredited to uh, St. Francis of Assisi. He said, preach the gospel at all times when necessary use words. Now, I don't know whether or not St. Francis of Assisi actually said that or not. I personally don't believe that he said it, but either way, it is not biblical. Even if he did say it, it is not biblical. It is designed to keep Christians quiet, or in other words, it's designed to keep Christians to be seen and not heard. We are to keep our gospel, our good news in our own homes and in our own lives. We are not to share it. Because Paul asked the, the, the Romans in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 through 17. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You cannot hear if someone do not speak. Paul did not intend to teach a silent gospel, but rather one that turned the whole world upside down, including the lukewarm bench warmers who, who, who want to see a great move of God or who don't want to see a great move of God because... Well, they have their own reasons, I'm sure. They quote this, this, this portion of scripture as well, Acts chapter 8, verse 9 through 13. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. This man had power. This man wasn't just, just pretending. This man had power. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and, and seeing signs and great miracles performed. He himself, Simon the magician, was amazed. Now, I don't understand why these people would use this scripture, this portion of scripture. Because obviously, this scripture is talking about power. 
Philip was operating in power, signs, wonders, miracles. He was moving in power. The scripture clearly proves that Simon himself, although he did not fully understand, saw something different, something powerful, something greater than what he currently had. Even though he had a lot of power, he amazed the people. They all believed that he was the power of the God that is called great. They were, they I guess they worshipped him because of all the power that he had. And he walked around as somebody big, like a big man in that town. But let me tell you that when he came in contact with real power, he saw the difference. And I want to clarify something. It was not just a prayer and a song and a sermon and then go home type of message either. It was a message of power. Otherwise, Simon would not have offered money for something so lame as one little message and a song and a poem and now you go home. No, there were something, there was some type of power that was happening there. I would suggest that if your pastor is preaching against something that is alive and active or against what Paul described like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. So if your pastor is preaching against power in the church, then I would suggest that as soon as that message is over, as soon as that message is done, that you would quickly and immediately leave and find a Bible-believing church that offers more than mere talk. It's time that the bride of Christ asks the question that the groom asked. Where is your faith? Is it hidden? Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about hidden faith later on in this series. But for now, I want to look at what Paul told the Corinthians church. I want to take a quick view of what kind of church that Corinthian church was. So let us start off with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. But I, brothers could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely humans? Paul said he could not address them as spiritual people because they were people of the flesh, infants in Christ, and acting like, believe it or not, they were acting like mere humans. Now, isn't that something? I really didn't notice that they were acting as mere humans before now. I mean, that is an amazing statement because after all, were they not mere humans? The truth is we are no longer mere humans when we get saved by accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior and being infilled by his Holy Spirit. We are now a new creation who is able to do what Jesus said that we, we could do. Look at John chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. It's not just the apostles. Listen, let's read that again. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Whoever believes in me 
will do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And remember, God is not a man that he should lie. All of his promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we can ask or even think. We can't even begin to imagine all the great things that God can do. And he can do it through us if we would only be obedient and have the faith. So now, let us take a look at how Paul describes the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 through 9. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you are enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. They did not lack any spiritual gift, but they were enriched in Christ Jesus in all speech and in all knowledge. They were guiltless because of the grace that they received through faith and in the finished work of our Lord, their Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. They were walking in power. They were working miracles. But because of, of they, they, not, not because of anything special about them, but because of the grace of Jesus Christ that was at work in them. In other words, it was their faith. This faith that we've been talking about, Ohopistus. Their faith that was reaching out and taking hold of the kingdom of God and his righteousness and was being empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent take it by force. And they were forcing their way into the kingdom. They weren't as spiritual as Paul wanted them to be because they had divisions in their church. Yet they were moving in miracles. They were moving in signs and wonders. They were moving in great messages. The pastor was preaching strong messages. He was preaching messages of faith and the people were receiving it. They were going out and they were making disciples. They were healing the sick. People would come to their church for deliverance. They were driving out demonic spirits. They were walking in power. So even though the Corinthians were carnal and mere babes in Christ, even though they were on spiritual milk and not solid food, they lacked no spiritual gift. Think about that for a moment. That suggests to me that spiritual gifts are not activated with maturity. You don't have to be a Christian a number of years, but it's activated through the faith. You might be a one hour old Christian, but by faith you can heal the sick and you can cast out demonic spirits. You can even raise the dead if you would just believe. Believe in the one who said you can do all things. If you only ask me, I will do it. Ask it in my name and see if I will not do it. You can do all these things through Christ or a better way of putting it, through faith in Jesus Christ who strengthens us and leads us into all truths. The only restrictions for a young Christian is that the young Christian in the faith that is, is that a new believer should not hold any high office. You know why? 
because it's a safety precaution to keep that new convert from getting a big head and being filled up with pride. Because when pride comes in, it opens the door to demonic activity and the new believer can get swept away. He can fall away from grace because of pride. But he can lay hands on the sick and they will recover if he has the faith. I believe there are gifts of the Spirit and there are rights of the believer. Let's think about this for a moment. You know, just like we have inalienable rights in America as stated in the Declaration of Independence, so do we have inalienable rights in the Lord. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. This is Jesus talking to, 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 to the believers just before he was taken up into heaven. He said, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, if Jesus said it, why are we preaching against it? I'm not understanding that at all. Jesus said it. Now we are to believe it. We are to act on it. These are our, our inalienable rights in the Lord. No one or nothing can take them away from us. Why? Because in those things, God is glorified. God receives glory whenever his mighty name is used in a righteous way. He wants to heal the sick. He does not want a sick. You have not received a sickness to teach you anything. Jesus paid for your health. He paid for you to be healed. You see, when we heal the sick, God is glorified because he wants the, the the, the sick healed. He wants blind eyes open. He wants to make the lame walk again. He wants to perform signs and wonders and miracles and perform mighty, mighty acts of healings. But his church, his bride, won't let him. We water our gospel down. We water it down way, way too much. Now, I want us to pick up from here next week. Join me next week. I, I want to pick it up from here. I will, but before we go, I want to ask, is there anyone who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but you would like to? Is there anyone out there like that? If you would like to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to say this prayer with me. A prayer of repentance. And Jesus will, will hear that prayer and he will save you. Also, I want to know, is there anyone out there who's sick in body? I want to pray for you. We believe in Sozo. The full healing of body, soul, mind, and spirit. We believe in the full healing because we believe that Jesus paid the full price. And if he paid for it, he wants to give it to us. Why pay for something that he doesn't want us to use? It's like paying for us to go to a restaurant for dinner and not giving us the invitation, not giving us that receipt. It doesn't make sense. If he paid for it, he wants you to have it. And he did pay for it at a high, high price. So if you want salvation, first of all, repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, Lord. 
and help me to walk in faith. Help me to operate in faith. Help me to talk in faith. I pray, Lord God, that my faith would stretch further than just a belief. But Lord God, that I would believe and have faith that I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Help me to walk in that faith. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're sick in body, I want you to place your hand on where it hurts. Place your right hand on whatever part of, of your body that is, that is sick. And I'm going to pray for you. We're going to believe by faith that you are healed. Because by His stripes, you are healed. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you that you've given us power, given us authority to use your name to speak health into our fellow believers. And right now, by the power and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God, I speak health. I rebuke that spirit of cancer and I command you to come out. I command healing into bodies right now. Joints are being healed right now by the name of the power and the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Depression, spirit of depression. I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. Spirit of anxiety, I command you to come out now in the name of Jesus. Spirit of panic attacks, I command you to come out now in the name and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God. And I speak peace, shalom peace over each and every one that is watching that accepts this, this message. I pray, oh Lord Jesus, that you would help each one to have the faith to receive. Receive your healing now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you all next week when we come back and we finish up this message and continue on in our series, Faith Revisited. Again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.